This morning, the Holy Spirit has spoken to me. I want you to go to Genesis 21, 4 through 14. And there you will find the assignment that the Lord has espoused for me to share with you on this Sunday morning. Genesis chapter 21, verse 4 through 14. It's our custom to stand for the reading of the word. If you're a visitor and everybody stood up, you thought they were leaving, but they're not. Genesis 21, beginning at verse 4, going through verse 14. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God commanded him. How old was he? He was eight days old. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God has made me to laugh <laughs> so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. I don't know whether that's so good or not, but... <laughs> <laughs> and, and the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham said, party. He made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. He threw a party. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, cast out this bond woman and her son for the son of this bond woman shall not be heir with my son even Isaac and the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son and God said unto Abraham let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bond woman in all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder. And the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Today I want to talk to you about the courage to change course. The courage to change course. Don't minimize that, don't sleep on that. That's, that's not easy to do, the courage to change course. I do sense a prophetic utterance. I do believe that somebody is going to get a word from the Lord that is going to be cut to the continuity of your situation that will begin to liberate strongholds and yokes in your life in an area that we seldom touch the courage to change course. Shout hallelujah. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us today. We don't want to operate in Wednesday's anointing or Sunday's anointing. We want a fresh anointing. Let fresh oil flow upon us in this moment in the name of Jesus. And I thank you in advance for what you're going to do. I don't even have to see you do it. I'll praise you now. You can do it later. Have your way in this place. Have your way in this place. Break some yokes in this place. Heal some bodies in this place. Change some lives in this place. Reach out, Lord, through the internet and let the power of the Holy Spirit sweep over the viewing audience that's watching us through cyberspace. I thank you, Jesus. You can cast out a demon online. 
I thank you, Jesus. You can rebuke a disease online. I thank you, Jesus. You can give divine direction. Do it for your people today. Do it for your people today. Do it for your people today. In the name of Jesus, give him the best praise you've got. Amen. You may be seated. Yes, sir. Let's go to work. It has been said about people that when people know better, they do better. And that sounds really, really profound. But over the years of my life, I wonder, is it true? Because everything that sounds good isn't always true. When people know better, they do better. I can't even say that's always true in my own life because there's a difference between knowing better and doing better. I know I don't have no business with dessert. I said I was going to watch my carbs. I know I should get up every morning early and exercise about 5.30 and jog about three miles. I know better. I know what to eat and what not to eat. I know what is healthy, what is not healthy. I have been informed. I have been educated. I know not to eat those oxtail. I know... Uh oh, y'all not gonna talk to me this morning. I, I, I know I don't need those barbecue ribs and the french fries. The waitress even asks you, do you want salad? And I, sometimes I just say, no. I know not to let them bring bread to the table because I know if it gets to the table, it's gonna, you know, especially if it's hot and it's warm and they've got good better. I know not to even risk bringing it that close to me because I know I'm not strong enough to resist it. When people know better, they say they do better, but it is possible. I know how to do curls. I know how to bench press. I, I know how to do lat pull down. I know how to do it. I know the form. I know what I ought to be doing. I know I should stretch every morning. It is not the absence of knowledge that always deters the activity, but the gulf between what we know and what we do is often a wide gulf and we don't always reach across. While it is impossible to do better if you don't know better, it's impossible. You can't do better if you don't know better. Often we still know better than we do. The truth of the matter is doing better isn't always easy. Sometimes it's real tough. Doing better isn't always easy. Doing better as a husband or a wife isn't always easy. We know what we should be doing, but we don't always do it. Sometimes we don't do better until we get in trouble. Sometimes we don't do better until we're under threat. Sometimes we don't do better until we have competition. Oh, it's going to be quiet this morning, Jesus. Angels, y'all shout for me this morning because the people are going to be quiet. Doing better on the job. We know what to do. We used to do it when we first got the job and we didn't take it for granted. We knew not to take a two and a half hour lunch. We knew how to be in our place. We knew not to be on the phone and playing video games in our office. We knew better. Yeah. You should wear some strong shoes because I'm going to step on some toes today. But whether we know better and what we do is two different things altogether. 
especially when you realize that the people we admire the most were people who put into action what they knew, who grew and changed and made corrections. They became our heroes because they had the courage to change course. All of the people that we highlight in our country and our history are people who had the courage to change course. Leaders like Abraham Lincoln had the courage to change course. It is not now, it's, we always honor people after they're dead. But in real time speed, our heroes were not popular because they went against the course and they swam upstream against the grain and they had to have courage to change the course. That's not easily done. Dr. King had to have courage to change the court. Nelson Mandela went to jail to change the court. You can get in trouble to change the course. Corrections can often have severe consequences. Corrections can often have severe consequences. Getting it right can have severe consequences. Because, see, you, you, you make a decision at one stage in your life, and then later you know better, but you're already in the situation. I never will forget, I was teaching a Bible class one time, and I was doing Q&A right here at this church, and a young man said something to me I will never forget. He said, I am the world's best at getting into situations and the world's worst at getting out. And I think the reason it becomes so difficult to get out is because sometimes it's become so complicated. It requires humility that some people lack the ability to quiet their ego enough to achieve the ability of change because sometimes you have to go against what you said at this stage to correct where you are at that stage. And some, until you become strong enough to admit, yes, I said it, but I was wrong, you can't bring about change. And sometimes your ego will make you be loyal to a mistake. I'm wondering if there's anybody in here who's ever been loyal to a mistake. And you, it was a mistake, and you knew it was a mistake, but you counted up the cost to fix it, and you decided you would just take the easy way out and live with it. Our, our decisions, you see, to correct our mistakes can create disruption, and not only disruption for us, disruption for other people. And when you look at what it's going to take to straighten it out, sometimes you just don't do it. And when you don't do it, you become trapped in a nightmare of regret. You'd be surprised how long you can live in the prison of your problems. You'd be surprised how long you can live a life where you clap like you're free, you talk like you're free, you move like you're free, but you're really not free at all because you are trapped in a complicated situation. You can't get out and you can't get in. You're just stuck. And so you clap stuck and you sing stuck and you go to choir rehearsal stuck and you go to work stuck and you come home stuck and you go to church stuck. And yes, you get your dance in every now and then, but you go back to a situation that's stuck because dancing doesn't bring about change. I don't care how much you praise the Lord until you correct your past decisions, you are not going to get the breakthrough that you need. And still you, until you stop using shopping for therapy, you're never going to have the credit rating that you should have. No matter how much he's Jehovah Jireh, he can't be Jehovah Jireh to you because as fast as he pours it in, you leak it out. And God is too much of a businessman to keep investing in a bankrupt system. And you know what it takes to fix it, and you know the discipline that's required to get your life together, but it's not always true that people who know better do better. And not doing better 
simply leaves you stuck. People often like the stomach for it, I think. To risk the pain of changing course. The uncertainty of what would life be like outside of the bubble of my normal. I hate my normal, but I'm afraid of change. So I'd rather stick with the devil I know. Oh, y'all not gonna talk to me this morning. Have you ever grown up and rethought your choices? Have you ever got more information and rethought your choices? Have you ever looked back at your life in retrospect and found yourself in situations that were based on bad information, immature decisions, selfishness, emotionalism, pride, discontentment, and restlessness, and now you're more mature and you're wiser and you wonder what you could have been had you started earlier on the right road. I wish I, maybe it's somebody that's streaming that needs what I'm talking about and you lay down at night and live with the frustration wonder what would have happened had I not got myself stuck we're almost like the woman in the commercial help I've fallen and I can't get up I change churches and I can't get up. I change spouses and I can't get up. I change jobs and I can't get up. I change my major and I can't get up. I change my hairstyle and I can't get up. I change the way I dress and I can't get up. It doesn't matter what I got on. It doesn't matter what I look like. I cannot seem to get up. So you give up when you can't get up. And you decide to yourself, maybe I just have to make the best of a bad situation. I guess I'm really talking about making a decision to live with regret. And you'd be surprised how many people in this room are living with regret. That they could clean up, that they could fix it, they could change it, they could alter. But sometimes the dilemma is, is it easier to live with regret or live without it and cause the disruption that is necessary in my normal to see the growth that I long to see in my life. Are you hearing what I'm saying about? Either way you go, have you ever been in a situation where either decision you made is gonna cause pain? Where are my real people at? Have you ever been weighing the pain you know, when I got ready to have back surgery, I wouldn't have had back surgery if I wasn't in pain. But I had to weigh the pain that I had before the surgery against the pain of having the surgery. And it took me a long time to make up my mind to have the surgery because either way I went, it was gonna be pain. And I had to decide, I ultimately decided that I would rather live with the pain of recovery. <laughs> rather than to live with the pain of ambivalence and indifference and the pain of ignoring and the pain of looking the other way and the pain I never will forget. I was in Washington, D.C. and I was in the hotel room and I was walking across the hotel room and fell and hit a glass coffee table and shattered the table and I said, that's it. I got to go. I got to do something about this. This is unbearable. I had been laying on the floor in the back before I went out to speak each night at the New Year's
experience revival because my back was in such pain that I couldn't hardly take it. One time I sat down in the service and I couldn't get up and my security had to come get me up out of the seat and I was in front of people and little by little by little by little I thought this pain is too much. The pain of ignoring it, the pain of looking the other way, the pain of making the best out of a bad situation, the pain of not wanting to make any way, the pain of dealing with my inability to walk into the unfamiliar, to walk into the unknown. I had never had surgery. I couldn't imagine what it would be like. It didn't sound good when they described it to me. They said, we're going to cut into your back four inches. I thought, not mine, you're not. You're not going to cut me up like you're slicing ribs at a barbecue. The devil is a lie. But the pain, the pain, you're weighing pain. I wasn't weighing promises. I wasn't weighing miracles. I wasn't weighing God's purpose. I wasn't weighing what God was going to do in my life. I was trying to go the way of least resistance. The real truth of the matter is we get trapped. We get trapped. We get trapped in our relationships. We get trapped in our health. We get trapped in the argument, mask, no mask. Vaccine, no vaccine. I heard this, I heard that, I heard that. We get trapped until being trapped makes us sick. And somewhere with a respirator in our mouth, Don't, don't, don't tell me because we're the ones that bury people, so we know. We know. We talk to the families. We deal with the people who didn't have the courage to change course. In fact, you have to have the, the adaptability in life to be able to change course. It's not like you get it right and it stays the way you left it. Life keeps changing and as life keeps changing and seasons keeps changing and circumstances keep changing, you gotta be flexible enough to change on a dime and switch this way and turn back this way. And if you don't make the right switch at the right time, you find yourself stuck. And you wake up one morning and you realize I'm getting older and I don't know what it feels like to have lived my best life. I, I, I've not lived my best life. I've not lived at the top of what my potential was. I've not reached the zenith of possibilities of what I could be. I've not fulfilled my purpose. I've not finished my core. I don't get any crown for me because I wasn't living my best life. I was surviving my old life. I know it's hard to shout this morning, but just keep breathing. And rather than to be free, we peer through the bars of depression, watching others move forward while we are stuck going in circles. In our text today, we step into the text that reads like a dream come true, a dream deferred, and finally realize that Abraham in his old age would finally have a son. It is absolutely amazing. It's exciting, it's invigorating that this old man whose body was as good as dead and his wife with her wrinkled knees has got in the birth position and delivered him a baby at a season in her life that it was illogical. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but whoever I'm preaching to today, what is at stake in this message is that God wants to give you a blessing that doesn't even fit the season of life you're in. He's going to give you a blessing out of season. 
He's going to give you a blessing that's out of step. He's going to give you a blessing that's going to make people laugh when they hear it because nobody's going to believe that a person like you could be in a position. In fact, some of you right now are in a position that would blow people's mind because you haven't always been Elder Flip Flop and you haven't always been Deacon Wonderful and you haven't always been Missionary Price. And if your old friends could see you now, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody shout, it's late, but it happened. <laughs> Type it on the line, it's late, but it happened. It's late, but it happened. It didn't come when I thought it would. It didn't come through who I would like for it to come through. It didn't even come how I would like for it to come. Though, let me say it like the old folks do. He may not come when you want him. Oh, but he's... We're talking about a finally moment here. We're talking about a finally moment. We're talking about a finally moment that happened to a man that's a hundred years old. He has waited a long time. When you have waited a long time for a blessing, it will make you give God the praise. See, some of y'all get stuff too easy and you get it too quick. But after you suffered a while, when God comes through for you, it'll make you want to. I want those of you that have been waiting on a blessing to get this word from God, it's still going to happen. Oh, y'all don't believe it, but the Lord said it's still going to happen. Just because it didn't happen when you planned for it to happen doesn't mean that God's not going to do it. It's still going to happen. Tell your wrinkled knees it's still going to happen. Tell your birthdays it's still going to happen. Tell your situation it's still going to happen. Go back into that raggedy house and say it's still going to happen. I'm going to give about 15 seconds for somebody to praise him like you've got a determination that it's not too late. It's still gonna happen. 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 You need to get your faith out of jail and say it's still gonna happen. Look at somebody and say it's still gonna happen. Type it on the line, it's still gonna happen. Yes! 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 Shout yes! Make you wanna celebrate. Make you want to celebrate. Make you want to clap your hands. Make you want to do your dance. Make you want to turn around in a circle. Make you want to do the shuffle. Make you want to jeep and shout. Make you want to run all about. It's still going to happen. Yes, that's right, sister, praise him up there. 
praise him. You don't need no music. You don't need no hand clap. Sometimes you got to throw your own party because God just spoke to you. He spoke in your spirit. He spoke in your belly. He spoke in your heart. It's still going to happen. So look here, sit with me a minute. So Sarah is having a party because she said, who would, (laughs) who would believe that God would do it for me? That I would give Abraham a child in his old age. She said, God has made me to laugh. She said, who would have thought that at this stage in my life, God would make me to laugh and all that hear it will laugh with me. And while she's laughing, Abraham is going through the ritual of circumcising his son. Pay attention to that. I'm going to deal with that a little bit more in a minute. Abraham, according to the customs of the time, circumcised his son as God had commanded him to do when he was eight days old. Okay? Eight days old. Eight days old. I told you last week, eight is the number of new beginnings. This is a happy moment. He's eight days old and Abraham circumcises him. And he finally gets to circumcise his son, born of his wife, in his house. And he's eight days old when he did it. And I was studying it, and I was thinking about it being his his first son by Sarah. And it was eight, and he was eight days old. And I thought about this being the eighth month. And the first day of the eighth month, and we're in it today, and God gave me this word for this day at this time, eight days old, first son, eight one, God is about to, oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Tell everybody around you, something's going to happen in here this morning. It's the eighth month. It's the first day. It's the eighth month. It's the first day. Something is going to happen in here today. And when the child was eight days old, Abraham circumcised his son. And the interesting thing, Sid, I'm just talking to you. The interesting thing... <laughs> The interesting thing about the text is when, it, when you read the text, it reads it as if it is all one occasion, but there's a time lapse here because we know that Isaac is eight days old when Abraham circumcises him. And then we read that when he was weaned, God, uh, Abraham threw a party. Okay. And we know he wasn't weaned at eight days. So there's a time lapse in the text. So the writer is only gleaning highlights of significant moments in the life of Abraham. And that's all life is, is significant moments. It's not hours or days or weeks or months. All that matters 
is significant moment. From eight days old when he circumcised him to however he old he was when he weaned him, nothing significant happened. But when he, when he was weaned, Abraham throws a party. And it was an amazing party. He threw the party, no doubt, a quite a distance from when he circumcised his son. Now, circumcision is the cutting away of the part of the flesh on a man that was originally a religious sign of being a Hebrew. It is not the covenant that God made with Abraham but it is the sign of the covenant. So God made a promise to him and then used the sign of circumcision to indicate that he had a contract with God. The circumcision put blood on it. I was doing some real estate business with some investors and they asked me, do you have any skin in the game? What God wanted you, God's going to do the work, but he wants you to have some skin in the game. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Because when you got some skin in the game, you don't violate the covenant when things get tough because you got some skin in the game. And God says, I'm going to do it for you, but I want you to have some... Oh, 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 oh y'all ain't going to talk to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because you won't quit when you got some skin in the game. You won't just walk away easy when you got some skin in the game. When you don't have nothing invested, it's easy to walk away when there is no. No skin in the game. This circumcision that starts the text permeates the text itself. I'm going to pick it up later and weave it into the text to show you that the text is all about circumcision. The text is all about circumcision. The courage to change course is all about circumcision. And I'm going to tell all the women so you, don't, so you can know and understand this, circumcision hurts. Not a little bit. <laughs> a whole lot. Yeah, circumcision hurts. Change. <laughs> I love him. I've been waiting on him to come back to church. I need him. Changing course hurts. There's no way for you to make significant change and not hurt. Because you got to have some. <laughs> he did it on the eighth day. And then. He begins to celebrate and he throws a party and things couldn't be better. He got his promised seed. His wife is happy. Life is good. It's hard for life to be good when y'all girls ain't happy. It's not that we're not happy, but when y'all are not happy, it's contagious. An unhappy woman is worse than COVID. Because <laughs> you can vaccinate for COVID for an unhappy woman. They still in the laboratory trying to fix something to make it easier to live with an unhappy woman. You can be happy, but when you come home and she's not happy, all of a sudden, 
I know you can't say amen because you're sitting beside her, but just wiggle your toe and I will hear it. I will hear the vibrations on the rug. It couldn't be better. Sarah is happy. She laughing. Ain't nothing like the laughter of a happy woman. She's laughing. He's got his son, his promised seed. He's got it in his old age. God has strengthened his loins. I don't blame him for throwing a party. Anytime you that old, no Cialis, no... It's time to get the popcorn out, roast you some hot dogs, have you a barbecue, blow a whistle. It is a happy moment. Everything is going wonderful. And then Sarah, the Bible says, looked out and saw Ishmael, Hagar's son, by Abraham, mocking Isaac. And the party was over. She stopped laughing. Put the cake back. Take the hot dogs off the grill. Put the party hat away, stop the music. She mad again. What you mad about now? I looked out the window. And do you not know what I saw? That woman's son was mocking my child. Now, if you want to make a woman mad, I mean, even them little quiet, nice, dainty little women who walk around with lace on their toes and, and got their fingernails with glitter on it, they turn into guerrilla warfare if you mess with one of them kids. Sarah said, put the cake up. Something's gotta be done. This girl have lost her mind. Her boy is out there mocking my boy. You got to do something. What you gonna do? What you gonna do? I just wanna know what you gonna do. I just wanna know what you gonna do about this. What you gonna do about this? I tell no, I'm gonna tell you what you gonna do. Let me tell you what you are going to do about this. Put her out, her and her nappy head child. Put both of them out. I don't care where they're gonna stay. I don't care where they're gonna live, but she gonna get up. I ebonized it just a little bit, but. And all of a sudden, All of a sudden, he has gone from cutting to casting. He's, he has gone from cutting to being asked to cast out the bondwoman and her son, which incidentally is his son. When Sarah says it, she says, cast out the bond woman and her son, but she knows that's his son. But Sarah don't have no skin in the game. And when you don't have no sin in the game, skin in the game, it's easy to tell people what they ought to do about their situation because you don't have no skin in the game. Now, if this would have been me, this text would have been longer. 
Because when she said, cast out the bond woman and her son, I would have got right back up in her face and said she wouldn't have been here in the first place if you hadn't have brought her in here. It ain't like I asked you for this woman. This was your idea in the first place. And now you want me to fix what you wanted me to do. You see, Hagar was never Abraham's idea. It was Sarah's idea because she thought it wasn't going to happen. And when she thought it wasn't going to happen God's way, she said, I'll do it my way. Henceforth, Israel becomes a child of the flesh. How many things have been born in your house out of the flesh? Out of your unwillingness to wait? out of your impatience, out of your frustration. How many decisions did you make without God? And by the way, wouldn't you hate to live in this house? You got two women in this house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can stop right there. That's the end of it right there. I got two women in the house. They don't like each other. And I got two sons in the house. One is born of the flesh and one of them is born of the promise. And this just sounds like a mess. But Abraham lived with it. Because sometimes change creates such disruption that you just make the best of a bad situation. How did Abraham go from throwing a party for his son to the biggest fight with his wife ever recorded? The fight was so big, they didn't have to call the police. God had to come. <laughs> now, you know that's domestic violence. When God has to come, y'all are really fighting when the only one who can break up the argument is God. Because Sarah has asked him, to cast out the bondwoman and her son. And I believe that Abraham was bond to the bondwoman. Bondwoman actually means that she was a servant, a slave. But I want you to understand that you can't spend that much time with somebody. You can't spend that many nights with somebody listening to them talking about their dreams and their hopes of what happened to them when they were seven. And, and when I was 12, my dog died and all of that. And after a while, there's a bond to what you bond with, you become bond to. Oh, it's only 12 that could say, man. The rest of them is using that mask as an excuse. Because as long as you got your mask over your mouth, you don't have to say nothing. You can say, I said it under my breath. What you bond with, you become bond to. And, and Hagar had become unnecessary flesh. She was attached. Ishmael was his flesh. And God is now doing to him what he started out doing to his son. For to cast out the bondwoman and her son is circumcision. <laughs> and, and Abraham is good at giving it. But now 
He's got to receive it. Oh, he's been circumcised in his body, but, but not in his relationships. And there is no way to get out of this without blood. This is going to hurt. And yet, in order to get his house together, he had to have the courage to change course. In fact, in all fairness, I have to give Sarah some credit. Sarah is making a correction because she is no longer the woman she was before. I want to talk to some people who are no longer the woman you were before. And yet you've got kids angry with you about what you did before. You, you've got spouses angry with you over what you did before. That ain't just for women. Let's talk to some men who have got some wives that are angry with you over what you did before. And the kids don't like you over who you were before. The problem is people never give people room to change, to grow to evolve. And even though we are Christians, we are the world's best at alienating people over what they did before. And it takes courage to correct or to change course. Because if he changes course, what will become of Hagar? Where, where will Hagar go? Where has the ring of Isaac's flesh gone? Hagar is cast into the wilderness. And when God comes down, God does not talk like Sarah. See, sometimes, sisters, You can be right about what you said, but wrong about how you said it. You said, cast out the woman, the bomb woman and her son. God comes down and says, I know Ishmael is your seed. Understanding is important to bring about change. You can't just look at it from your perspective just because you don't have no skin in the game. Abraham has skin in the game. Ishmael is his son too. Ishmael is his son, but Ishmael is your mistake. Oh, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. I'm going somewhere. I'm gonna get it back to you in a minute because everybody in here has an Ishmael. Everybody in here, male or female, has nothing to do with gender, has, has something that you were bond to because you bond with that created a problem that you live with. Whether it's baby mama drama or whatever it is, or baby daddy drama, you, you, you went out with him. He a dog. You went out with a dog. You picked the dog. You liked the dog. You brought the dog home. You went to bed with the dog. You had a baby with the dog. Now, all you can see is he a dog. Well, what does that make you? I guess you're a dog lover. Because save he raped you. See, until we take responsibility for the mistakes we made, we cannot change course. As long as you push it off and act like it was just them 
and you tell the story where you are always the hero, this woman would have never been in Abraham's life. You brought the woman into his life. You came up with the strategy of them sleeping together. You told him to have a baby. You made this woman uh, your slave and made her sleep with a man that she never picked to sleep with and now it's all blown up in your face and you want to act like it's his fault. But what is amazing about the text is God comes down and says to Abraham, hearken unto the voice of your wife Sarai. Because the woman is right, even though she said it wrong. She is right. And what is happening here is correction. Now I'm almost finished. In order to have correction, you have to have the challenging responsibility of trusting God to handle our mistakes. God says to Abraham, leave Hagar to me. I know Ishmael is your son. I will make of him a great nation. But you can't take your mistake and your miracle and put them all in the same house and make it work. There has to come a cutting away. A cutting away. You can't change course if you can't cut. You can't change course if you can't cast out. And the challenge is to trust me with the collateral damage. Who am I preaching to? Trust me that I don't need you to take care of Ishmael. God says, my grace is sufficient for your mistakes. My, my grace, my grace, my grace, my grace is sufficient. You don't have to live in this chaos. Your spirit has been in a state of constant disruption because you won't change course. And I don't want you to live in this constant, chaotic, stressful environment of forlornment because your mistakes and your miracles are cohabitating in the same space. All I need from you is the courage to change course. If you don't change course, you're going to mess up your destiny. If you don't change course, you're going to mess up your future. If you don't change course, you're not going to be in the place you need to be to become who I created you to be. If you don't change course, you're going to spend the latter years miserable because you won't own up to your mistakes and acknowledge that you were wrong and you won't fix it. And all the dancing and all the shouting and all the giving you do over top of it will not take away from the fact that you still need the courage to change course. Who, 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 who in here needs the courage to change course? You know what they say? The definition of lunacy is to continue to do the same thing, expecting a different result. You can't be the woman you want to be and the woman you used to be at the same time. You cannot be 
the man you were created to be and the man you used to be at the same time. And you know that now. But the problem is you just can't bring yourself to change course because of all the people that it would hurt for you to change. And how long will you make those people more important than your destiny? God said, turn them over to me. Oh God, I'm talking to somebody. I'm talking to somebody, I don't know who it is. I'm, see, the Lord sent me here to loose somebody this morning, to liberate somebody this morning. You've been in bondage. You can't even be your best self. You can't do your best work. You can't be who you were created to be because you're stuck in a situation that you helped to create and you're guilty and you feel guilty and you overcompensate because you're guilty and you're in this situation because you're guilty and you're stuck because you're, either way you move, somebody's going to get hurt and if you don't move, it's going to be you. <laughs> Lift your hands up and say, God, give me the courage to change course. That means I might not get to say everything I want to say. That means I got to hold my peace sometimes. That means sometimes I got to bite my lip. That means sometimes I've got to learn another discipline. That means sometimes I got to bleed. But if I have to bleed to be better, I'm willing to bleed. I'm willing to bleed a little while to be better for a long time. See, I realized that if I didn't have the surgery, the pain would never go away. And if I had the surgery, I would have pain for a little while, but eventually the pain of recovery will go away. See, circumcision hurts real bad, but it doesn't hurt real long. Putting out the bond woman hurt real bad, but it didn't hurt real long. And you got to decide, are you willing to have a little momentary discomfort to be where you are called to be? Or are you so concerned about the disruption that your change creates that you're willing to be a prisoner in your own life the rest of your life. That's what this text says to me. That's what I get out of this text. That's why this text is important to me. Because every time I ever made a change, somebody got hurt. When God called me to come to Dallas, somebody got hurt in West Virginia. There are people who don't like me now. I've been here 25 years and they're still mad. There are other people that accept it and they're glad about it, they see it, they get it, but there are some people that just simply refuse to get over. And I had to decide, am I gonna spend the rest of my life honoring your expectations of me? Or do I get to live my life the way God called me to live my life? You leave when you want to leave. You come when you want to come. You miss church when you feel like missing. But if I'm not here, you say, well, I came to church and you wasn't there. Don't I get to be a person too? I'm, I'm going to break your chain today. The chain that ties you to living up to other people's expectations all of your life. The chain that circumvents you from reaching your destiny and your purpose so you can go ahead and fulfill what God created you to fulfill. We are going into a week of change. 
We're gonna change course. We're gonna change direction. We're gonna change our focus. We're gonna change our attitude. We, I don't care whether we get to have worship or preaching or whether we just come in here and lay flat out on the floor. I want a gully washing, Holy Ghost, anointed, supernatural revival. Revival is to wake up what's dead to bring back to life that that has gone away, to restore, to bring back the luster of really knowing God. I don't want to pastor church people. I want to pastor saints, real believers who are washed in the blood of the Lamb, who really want to serve God. I'm, I don't want to pastor people who just want to take God on a weekly date on Sunday. Some of you all don't love God, you date him. Y'all got a weekly date on Sunday. But Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday belong to you. And if it's not Sunday, you don't have no skin in the game. And you're asking God for a seven day blessing with a one day commitment. And you've lost your ability. And God sent me to say to you that in order for him to do what you have been praying about, you are gonna have to be disciplined enough to put some skin in the game. If you don't put any skin in the game, God cannot do what he wants to do in your life. But if you present your body a living sacrifice before God, God said, I will do a new thing in you and the former things in your life will be passed away. I hear God talking to somebody. I don't know who it is, but if you're ready for change, give him 30 seconds of crazy praise. I need change on the inside. I need change on the outside. I need change in my heart. I need change in my spirit. Give me my anointing back. Give me my power back. Give me my consecration back. I gotta have some change for the devil that I'm fighting right now. I need a real Holy Ghost change. I can't hear you praising God. I can't hear you. 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 See, the problem with the church, we want to have a good service, but we don't want to put any skin in the game. Open your mouth and praise him till you got skin in the game. I'm gonna put some skin in the game. I'm gonna put some skin in the game. For the breakthrough I've been praying for, I'm willing to put some skin in the game. I'm willing to invest in it. I'm willing to sow into it. I'm willing to work on it. I'm willing to labor for it. I'm willing to hurt for it. Lord, here I am, just as I am. I put skin in the game. Open your mouth and give God some praise. Yes, 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 
It costs what it costs. 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 Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. This is how bad I want it. This is how bad I want it. This is how bad I want it. I'll rearrange my schedule. I'll move if I gotta move. I'll change if I gotta change. Whatever it takes, I'll apologize. I'll lay on my face. But whatever it takes, I want change. Somebody holler with all your might. I'm getting ready to change course. Go to eight people, tell them I'm getting ready to change course. I'm gonna change course. I'm gonna change course. Before the week is over, I'm gonna change course. Before the week is over, I'm gonna change course. Before the week is over, before this week, before this week, before this week, before this week, I'm going to change, I'm going to change it, I'm going to change it, I'm going to break that chain, I'm going to break that yoke, I'm going to change. I got to change it. Look at somebody say, I got to change it. I got to change it. The angels ain't going to change it. The prophet ain't going to change it. The bishop ain't going to change it. The choir ain't going to change it. The potter's house ain't going to change it. I got to change it. I'm going to change it. I'm going to change it. I'm going to change it. If you don't change, the rocks will cry out. If you don't change, the rocks will cry out. Change it, change it, change it, change it, change it, change it, change it in my life, change it in my life, change it in my spirit, change it in my finances, change it in my heart, change it in my life, whatever it takes, get me behind me, a change. A change. Change. Change is coming. A change is coming.
Where's the Antar? Shane is coming. Come here. I don't want anybody to do this before I do. I want to 8-1, a new beginning, a season of change. Take 81 out of there. I don't want anybody to do it before I do it. I dedicate this week to God. August the 1st, 8-1. The baby was eight days old. I decree and declare there will be change. There will be a cutting away there will be a casting out. 
there will be a singleness of heart, <laughs> a wholeness in spirit. I'm not just talking about you, I'm gonna do this for myself. I, I, I want the courage, the courage, the courage, the courage, the courage, the courage, the courage to change, the courage to change. I'm running out of time. I don't have time to play games. The courage to change. You're watching online. Join me if you want to. You're in the building. Join me if you will. But I send this up, this little seed. It ain't much as a little seed, a little seed offering to God. I offer up a sacrifice. There will be change. I decree and declare a new beginning. I decree and declare a new beginning in the midst of all of this chaos and political antics and racial indifference, in the midst of all of this turbulence, in the midst of this pandemic, I decree and declare a change in the name of Jesus. This is my garden of Gethsemane. This is a place where I make up my mind, not my will, but thine be done. This is a place that I cast out the bondwoman. This is a place that I cut away the flesh. This is a place where I put some skin in the game. This is a place where I decree and declare for discipline. How many of you struggle to be disciplined? I decree and declare for a greater discipline in your life, in your business, in your affairs, in your finances, in your relationships. You're gonna stop being guided by your emotions and you're gonna be guided by the promise of God. No more guilt, no more shame, no more incarceration to your past. No more nursing people's feelings that shouldn't even be in the house. Cast out the bondwoman. I want to be new. I want to be, you the pastor, what you talking about, you want to be new. Yes, pastors need to be renewed. Singers need to be renewed. You can't keep giving out to people and not become depleted. You need to be renewed. Deacons need to be renewed. The elders need to be renewed. The saints online need to be renewed. The people in this building need to be renewed. We need a renewal. Somebody shout yes. And it's just a little seed, but I'm gonna sow it as a sign as a sign that I'm committed to the discipline that's necessary. I'm gonna stop running a nursery for everybody else's feelings but mine. Today, God liberates us from people, from the bondage of their expectations, from the fear of their criticisms, from the pain of their, mar their remarks. Today, we come into a new place of alignment. Admittedly, we've made some bad choices. Admittedly, we've made some poor judgments. But now that we know better, <laughs> Knowing better don't mean a thing if you don't do better. Knowing that you should eat right ain't eating right. <laughs> Knowing that you should save ain't saving. Knowing that you should shut your mouth don't shut your mouth. It don't count till you do it. How many are making a commitment I'm gonna do this thing? I'm gonna do this thing. Eight one, a new beginning. And, and, and in fact, in fact today, in fact, as other people are sowing and as they're giving, 
if there's a person in this room and you need newness, Jesus came to make us new and he put skin in the game. He went to Calvary and he put skin in the game. But if you don't put yours in, you can't have new life. I cannot dwell in a tent with the wicked. Today, whether you're online, whether you're watching in Houston or Atlanta, New York or DeSoto, whether you're in South Dakota or South Africa, whether you're in Nigeria or Birmingham, Alabama, I decree and declare that we'll be changed. There will be change. I'm not waiting on nobody to come save me. I'm not waiting on nobody to come get me. I decree and declare there will be change. It may, it may hurt a while while I get the discipline to commit my way unto the Lord, but whatever it takes, there will be change. If there's a person in this room, the only one I know who can help you to really change your life is Jesus. Abraham and Sarah argued all the way until God came in the tent. When God came down and came in the tent, he straightened everything out. He put everything in order. He moved the flesh out. He moved the, the spirit in. The flesh out and the promise came in. And he gave Abraham the thing that you can't buy in a store and you can't get with a degree. He gave him focus. When the eye is single, the whole body is full of light. But a house divided against itself shall not stand. We praise you with singleness of heart. We've had too many distractions trying to keep this one and please that one and please that one and satisfy that one and, 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 and not make waves and, and trying to compensate and overcompensate, overdoing it, giving out of guilt. But today we make a change. Friend, if you're in this room and you don't know Jesus, if you're in this room and you've set New Year's resolutions and You've had moments where you felt guilty and cried, but you're tied to an addiction and you're tied to a problem and you're tied to a way of living and a way of thinking and a way of doing things that's just dragging you down. You got to decide which pull is stronger, the pull of the Holy Spirit or the pull of your flesh. It is a gift to come to God. The Bible says nobody can come to God save the Spirit draw them. If the Spirit, if you are here and you are an unbeliever or a backslider and the Spirit is calling you home, hold your hand up right where you are. Hold your hand up. I see you, I see you, I see you. Where else? I see you, I see you. I see you, hold it up high, don't be ashamed. Hold it up, I see you all the way in the back. I see you, I see you, I see you. If the Holy Ghost is saying, change your life, hold your hand up. I see you. I see you. The Spirit of God sees you. I want you to leave, put the other hand up with it. it means I surrender. The fight is over. I give up. And I want to pray with you with both your hands up. Father, you see those raised hands. You see the ones that are online. You see the ones that I cannot see. You know that their hearts are open and they need a touch from you. And right now, in the name of Jesus, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a world gone crazy, 
in the middle of tough times and personal problems and past pain and trauma and abuse and all types of things. We confess our sin. We've been wrong. We made some bad choices. We've done some dumb things. Some of this trouble wasn't Satan. Some of it was us. But be that as it may, we come clean right now. Come into their hearts. We believe that you died for our sins and that you rose for our justification. And right now, right where I stand with my hands up, I invite you into my life, into my crazy house, into my chaotic situation, into my contradictory circumstances. I invite you in right now with my whole heart. I say yes to you. I say yes to your will and yes to your word. I say yes to you. I say yes to your way. And whether I'm weak or whether I'm strong or whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, I commit to you right here and now, I'm going to walk with you all the way back home. Lord, it sure feels good to have a new beginning. This is my eighth day. This is my new beginning. This is my fresh start. This is the day that I cut away my flesh and my fleshly choices. This is the day I say yes to God. Now I want you to praise Him right where you are and accept what He did in your life in Jesus' name.